Thank you, Benita. I invite you to open your Bibles today to Romans chapter 2. If you'll take the Pew Bible, we are going to read together the same translation. Romans chapter 2, today we look at verses 1 through 16. Shall we now stand and read the Word of God together? Let us begin. Romans 2, 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, whoever you are, when you judge another. For in passing judgment upon him you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who do such things. Do you suppose, O man, that when you judge those who do such things, and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Three weeks ago, we looked at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32 which spoke of the slide of humanity away from God. The totality of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, is intended to manifest that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 1 addresses the sin of the pagan person, the non-Jewish person of the first century world, or the non-religious person of the 20th century world. And chapter 2 addresses the religious person, the Jewish person of the first century world, the good Greek of the first century world, and of the 20th century world, the outstanding and moral citizen. We understand this whole section best if we remember that it probably was given by Paul in preaching form at synagogues when he would first go and declare what the gospel message was all about. He, in fact, is dictating this letter to his secretary, Tertius. We find that at the end, Romans chapter 16. So the teaching is first being given in oral form. No doubt, as he sets before the Roman Christians, the, his understanding of the contents of the Christian gospel, he has simply reflected what he has preached many times when he has entered a synagogue and there first proclaim the gospel. What Paul is doing is something very adroit in the spirit. For he is starting out by the people outside the walls. And heads inside the walls of the synagogue begin nodding in agreement as Paul talks about the corrupt pagan world. Yes, they're bad out there. They're idolaters. They're our homosexuals. 
There are people who are causing society to disintegrate. It's a cold, cruel, and bad world. And isn't it good to be inside the walls, to be inside of a religious institution, to be a religious person? Isn't there tremendous security in that? Paul, in chapter 2, will stand that feeling on its head. What he is doing is something like this. If I were to take you, and you haven't been exercising lately, and take you over to a track, which is usually about a quarter of a mile in diameter, and say our object today is to run 100 miles without stopping. (laughs) No way. I'd like you to begin. You might get a lap or two around the track. I doubt if you would go over two laps, that's about half a mile, and would probably take you about six to seven minutes, and you would be pushing it. Now, if I got on that same track, I'm glad to report, I could now go around the track 12 times before I collapsed. But my 12 times only amounts to three miles. I could look at you who maybe made it around the track once or twice and say, look at how good I am. I made it around the track 12 times. You only made it around once. And missed the whole point, that in order to complete the course which was set before me, I needed to go around the track not 12 times, but 300 times in order to make the 100 miles. The picture of God's righteousness, His absolute holiness, His perfection is set forward in the Scripture. And since everything about God is morally perfect, and everyone around Him must be morally perfect, to be acceptable to God is to run that race, if you will, of a hundred miles. Sometimes people that have run three miles look back on the person that's run a quarter of a mile and say, we're better than you. Paul's object in chapter 2 is to bring us face to face with the inacceptability of ourselves in the presence of God because as far as we have gone, we have not gone far enough. He really does two things in these 16 verses. In the first verse, he establishes the premise of judgment. And in verses 2 through 16, he establishes, as the Spirit dictates to him to write or moves upon his spirit, three principles of God's judgment. The premise is simply this. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, whoever you are, when you judge another. For in passing judgment upon him, you condemn yourself. Paul is saying to this religious audience of the first century and to the religious audience of the 20th century, are you shaking your heads in agreement when I say the world is idolatrous and they should not be? There are homosexuals and there should not be. There is envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, gossiping, slandering, hating God, insolence, haughtiness and the like. Are you agreeing with me that these things should not be? When you agree with me, you are judging these things, that they are wrong. And by the very fact that you judge they are right and wrong, you establish the principle of judgment. You know, or you agree, that there is right and wrong because you have made the decision yourself about what is right and wrong. So when you judge others, immediately you have set up a principle of judgment. Now I'd like, before we go any further, to give an invitation to all of those in this room who have never judged anyone else you can leave. The rest of this message won't deal with you at all. (laughs) But if you would like to stay along with me, we'll we'll go on. (laughs) Anyone leaving? In fact, we're all staying as we're, we're we're getting into the premise of what Paul is talking about. We judge others. For example, a person will say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. By that very statement, they manifest a judgment against hypocrisy which means that when the hypocrisy occurs in themselves, it also must require judgment because they have agreed that there is a standard of hypocrisy and non-hypocrisy. What you condemn in others, Paul is simply saying, you must also condemn in yourself. But the trouble with his first century audience was that they had not honestly looked at themselves. I wouldn't be so brazen as to suggest that there is a comparison between the church and the original audience to which Paul is speaking, I hope that we have been tenderized by the gospel of Christ 
to avoid some of the errors which Paul is pointing out to this first congregation. But I find in myself a tendency to be in some areas of my life a lot easier on myself than I am on others for the same kinds of things. In fact, by the way, just parenthetically, if you will approach this scripture today from the standpoint you don't know a thing about the gospel, you will really, you will really see a better focus of what Paul is saying because this will be important as we go through it. I am, however, lighter on myself often than I am on others. Now, there's some ways I'm hard on myself, but other spots of me I have a blind side. Last night we were in the car talking and I was mentioning, to, we were having, I don't know what we were talking about. I was having a discussion with a kid of some kind and I mentioned to them that, that sometimes daddy does get angry. And Evangeline, our oldest, 10 year old girl, right up and agreed with that. Sometimes, daddy, you get angry. My wife, to soften the blow, said, no, daddy doesn't get angry. He just gets upset. <laughs> I like that loyalty. I often rename what I do. Other persons gossip, but I share information. <laughs> Somebody else is stubborn. But when it's me, I stand for principle. Another person is disorganized. Oh, they are so disorganized. But me, I'm busy. <laughs> that person is critical. They have a critical spirit. I make helpful suggestions. Someone else is proud. I simply have a good self-image. Someone else is inconsistent. You never know where they are from one day to another. They are so inconsistent. I'm just flexible. <laughs> and I up and demonstrate Paul's premise. Chapter 2, verse 1. In judging others, you yourself are judged. Now he gets under my skin. What he is doing is bringing a very unpopular message, the task any preacher in the flesh withdraws from. If you want to win popularity, you want to win favor, and there's a legitimacy to that. But to that audience, the apostle is coming saying, before, before you can really embrace the gospel, you must be unsettled and made uncomfortable with what you are and the way you're looking at your life. In chapter 2, therefore, verses 2 through 16, three principles of judgment are articulated by which God judges the good person. And the title today of the message is, Do Good People Need the Gospel? The first principle that is enunciated is that God judges according to truth. Verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who do such things. Literally, this phrase may read, we know that the judgment of God is according to truth upon those who do these things. It's according to truth. God has all the information that is needed in order to make a judgment on our life. And as a judge, he is totally incorruptible. Therefore, when he judges, it will be unlike someone else's judging of me or even my judgment of myself. It is according to truth. Since it is according to truth, Paul raises the question, do you think you will escape the judgment of God? Simply because... You belong to a religious club, or you came from the right bloodline, or you have the right contacts. Does this then excuse you from the judgment of God? Not if that judgment is according to truth. We must remember the kind of thought concepts that were going on in the audience to which Paul speaks. Intertestamental literature, the wisdom of Solomon, speaks of the kind of pride, of ethnic pride that was evident in the first century Jewish community. The wisdom of Solomon says, Even if we sin, we are thine, knowing thy dominion. And while therefore thou dost chasten us, thou scourgest our enemies ten thousand times more. Now that is not just something reserved for a synagogue audience in the first century. It's characteristic even sometimes of Christian congregations and 
people who feel a smugness in their religion without a real vital religious faith in the Lord, saving faith. Paul poses the question, if God judges rightly or according to truth, can anyone escape? He like four ways in which you can escape our judicial system if you've done wrong. First of all, you can escape it if no one finds out that you did wrong. <laughs> Just get it covered over. Secondly, if you get found out, you have the chance of escaping to another jurisdiction, maybe, if the crime is not of a certain caliber. For example, in the days before the universal 55 mile per hour speed zone, have any of you ever ridden in a car or been with a person or done it yourself? As you came to the Kansas border with an unlimited speed zone and you were in Missouri at 65, stepped on the gas at about five miles away from Kansas and floored it, <clears throat> knowing that if the red light began chasing you, all you had to do was escape to another jurisdiction and you would be safe. I can tell some of you have done that. Saw <laughs> oh, a smile. Or a third way is if you are apprehended, there can be a default somewhere in the whole legal apparatus, some way you can be sprung through a breakdown in the legal mechanism, or even fourthly, you could escape if after you are judged, you are put in an institution and you manage to rig up your escape and get away. In respect to the judgment of God, none of these things could be true. There is nothing that can be hidden over. He knows. There can be no breakdown in the legal mechanism of his judgments because he will judge fairly and rightly and he will judge with dispatch. There can be no escaping to another jurisdiction. Where can man flee from God's presence? And there will be no escape once this sentence has been passed. Paul therefore raises this question to begin to get us if we are smug in a feeling of self-satisfaction and and a feeling that we can get salvation simply by who we are, where we have come from, and what societies we belong to, he rises as a troubler. And he goes on in this principle, according to truth, to say, not only do you think to escape God's judgment, but do you not know that God's judgment is delayed because of his kindness? This kindness of God is expressed in his forbearance and in his patience or long-suffering. God does not move to judge every sin we do at the moment we commit it because of forbearance. He is willing to put up with ungratitude and lovelessness. And because of God's patience or long-suffering, he defers rebuke and punishment as long as possible. And God is often criticized for this quality of long-sufferingness. The question is raised. How can a just and a loving God permit the injustice and vileness that takes place in the world? How can God allow a tyrant like Idi Amin or Leonid Brezhnev or Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin to arise and to murder millions of people? How can he allow godless regimes to come into existence and crush people, usurp their rights, put them in prison, spread sorrow and destruction across the land? Why does God allow this to go on year after year? Why doesn't God judge these persons? Because when God judges, he must judge universally. He must judge one and all. The question we ought rather to ask is, why didn't God judge me yesterday when I said that sharp and caustic word which drove like a barbed arrow through the heart of someone else? Why didn't he shrivel up my hand when I took that pencil and cheated on my income tax? Why didn't he strike me dumb when I was gossiping on the phone the other day, sharing a tidbit that made somebody else look bad in someone else's eyes? The reason why he does not execute justice or judgment is because of his patience. Why? To give us time to come to himself. Paul is saying to that first century religious audience, to the 20th century religious audience that does not have a saving faith, he's looking at that audience and he's speaking to it and saying, by ignoring that judgment upon yourself, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day when God's wrath will be made manifest. Or, to put it in a more picturesque way, a way we can see it better, it's like living in a, in a small town at the base of a great dam. And behind the dam, the water is building and building. 
And the life in the town goes on as if nothing was happening behind the dam. And one day the dam breaks loose and the water inundates the town. Paul likens this to the theme of God's judgment on individual life and on the world. God's judgment is according to truth. Who could stand that kind of a judgment? Who could stand God administering a lie detector to their lives? Paul indicates that the second principle of God's judgment is according to works, verses 6 through 10, especially the principles enunciated in verse 6. He will render to every man according to his works. You say, Pastor Wood, I thought here that this was the gospel that preaches salvation by faith. What's Paul saying? He will render according to works. Well, notice he immediately qualifies it. Remember, he hasn't even gotten into defining the gospel yet for his audience. He's working with language and terms they know of and would think through. He immediately defines works as those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. The good works are those who seek. The work is in questing after God, which is really an attribute of faith as well. In the New Testament, Cornelius is a prime example of this, isn't he? In Acts chapter 10. Here is a good man, a moral man, a philanthropic man, an outstanding citizen, a supporter of the synagogue, a righteous man, a praying man, yet without salvation. But he is seeking God. He is by good works, as verse 6 puts it, and 7, seeking for glory and honor and immortality. And God rewards that search. Doesn't Jesus himself... Say this, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Paul says judgment will fall upon the factious. That's a term meaning the self-seeking. Those who simply live to please themselves. Those who do not obey the truth. Instead of eternal life, there is wrath and fury and tribulation and distress. If salvation is to the Jew first, distress also, Paul notes, is to the Jew first. That is, it comes upon the religious person first. Because they are in the vantage point of having set themselves up as an authority on religious affairs. They have the first opportunity to receive and the first opportunity to be judged. Now, underneath this principle of according to works, what in reality Paul will develop as he goes through this Romans letter is that if one is waiting to be judged on the basis of his works, also he doesn't have a hope. If you'll seriously sit down with what you're doing, and look at the righteousness of God, you will notice that there's a chasm between his righteousness and your life. So if God judges according to the principle of works, we have as little hope for salvation as if he judges according to the principle of truth, because by both counts we cannot stand. This brings us through to a third principle of judgment stated in verse 11. God shows no partiality. This word partiality literally means to receive the face. It could be used, for example, if I were a judge and stood a line of people up and all were charged with the same offense and I looked down the row and saw a person whose face I knew. I received their face and I said, Oh, John, very nice. You come over and stand over there. You don't have to face the same thing the other people do. That's to receive the face. Of course, it makes all the other people standing in line very upset. God is no respecter of persons. Now this statement is a great freeing statement for the Christian, by the way. This fact that God is not a respecter of persons or he shows no partiality should free believers from the terrible idea that is sometimes knocked around in the Christian church that before the beginning of time, God played Russian roulette with the human race and elected certain persons to damnation that he didn't like for some reason or the other. God shows no partiality. Now this fact that God doesn't show partiality means that he cannot judge the world that has not heard of God in the scriptures. He cannot judge that world by the same standards he judges the religious world by. Paul is saying to his first century Jewish audience, you have the Old Testament, you have the law, God will judge you by the law. But he would be showing partiality if he judged the people who had never had the word by that same law. Therefore, he judges them by the law that is in their conscience. They have an unwritten law of the heart and he will be fair in his judgment. 
In fact, Paul goes so far as to say that on that day, verse 15, their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Notice, he says, their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse. He does really something incredible here because he holds out the theoretical possibility that a person who has never heard of Jesus Christ or the person who has never heard of the law may come to a saving faith in God or perhaps excuse. But on the one hand here, in verse 15, he holds out the theoretical possibility in Romans 3.23 as a practical matter of saying it. He will indicate he has never met such a person. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one has even lived up to conscience. So there's kind of a, a balance going on there. We'll talk more about this in just a minute. I think it's safe to say, now with the work of anthropology, that while there is, from culture to culture, varying impl implementations of right and wrong, within each cultural system, there is indeed this law of the heart, which says there is wrong and there is right. One of the fascinating stories to come out in the last few years is this, it was, there was a summary of it in uh, Reader's Digest a year ago called Peace Child. Many of you may have read it. I understand it's being made into a movie. A couple of Wycliffe missionaries went out to, the, uh, to Dutch New Guinea in a very primitive area among a group of people called the Sawi, S-A-W-I. This group was uh, one of the more primitive and uh, also cannibalistic, and it was in the early to mid-60s that they went to work among this tribe. They could not believe the moral standards of this tribe. Here was a tribe that actually prized the person who was a traitor. He was the person on the highest moral value level of that society. So much so that when the missionaries were trying to translate the, the uh, gospel into written form and were learning the language from the people, they had been verbally working with the people to explain the facts of the gospel, the life of Jesus. And the missionaries were very frustrated because the people did not seem to be listening all that much to their description of the good Son of God. So one day when this missionary, Don Richards, was telling them in their own language the story of Christ's betrayal, and he says this, Only once in my presentation of the gospel did I win a ringing response. I was describing Judas Iscariot's betrayal of the Son of God. About halfway through, I saw that they were all listening intently. They noted the details. For three years, Judas kept close company with Jesus, sharing the same food, traveling the same road. The Sawi were intrigued. That any associate of Jesus could conceive of betraying such an impressive figure was highly unlikely. If anyone had conceived the idea, one of Jesus' inner circle of trusted disciples would have been the least likely. Yet Judas, having penetrated Jesus' group of disciples, betrayed him and carried out the dreadful act alone. At the climax of the story, Judas kisses betrayal. One man gave a low whistle of admiration. Several others touched their fingertips to their chests in awe. Still others chuckled. At first I was confused. Then the realization broke through. They were acclaiming Judas as the hero of the story. A cold feeling gripped my spine. I tried to protest that Jesus was good. He was the Son of God, the Savior. It was evil to betray Him. But nothing I said would erase that gleam of savage enjoyment in their eyes. One man leaned forward and exclaimed, That was the real Tui Asioni man. After the meeting, I called Narai, one of my language informants, and asked him the meaning of that disturbing phrase. Narai looked through the window and pointed to a young pig roaming freely around the village yard. Tun, he said, when Haro first caught that pig, he kept it in his home, fed it by hand, and protected it from the village dogs. Now that it is roaming about, he still throws down scraps of food for it every day. The pig feels secure, protected, well-fed. But one day when the pig is mature, Hato and his family will butcher it and eat it. Tui Asioni man means to do the same thing with a man as Hato is doing with that pig, to fatten him with friendship for an unexpected slaughter. Here is the missionary working from the statement of Paul, God has written within the law of conscience what is right and what is wrong in a society where you were admired. If you let someone in another tribe think you were his friend, 
and got him to let down his defenses and then killed him and ate him and that very same night used his skull for the first time as your pillow. Well, because Don Richards had so many different tribes working in a close, living in a close proximity to help him with this language work, he realized that there was so much violence now beginning to take place in the tribes that he could no longer, for the sake of their safety, allow the situation to continue. They needed to go back to the jungle where they could live my, several miles apart from one another and the friction wouldn't be so great. So he called the leaders together and he told them that he was leaving. They were distressed because they had come to have some sort of appreciation for him, his wife and his baby. They then find themselves held a council meeting and determined the following course of action. The next day, one of the men in the, one of the tribes ran with his own baby, his wife following after him, running just as fast as she could to catch him, and he brought that baby over to the other tribe and gave it to a man in the tribe. The other man then took his baby away from his wife and she chased him all across the encampment over to the other tribe and gave his baby back to the other man. And that was a baby called a tarob, which would now be brought up totally by the other family. The missionary couldn't figure out what was going on and inquired, what is the meaning of this? They said, that is our tarob baby, our peace child. Whenever in their society two tribes would come together so as to make a pact that they would not betray one another as one fattens a pig for the slaughter. The only way one could be sure that they would keep their word is if they switched children called a peace child and the safety and welfare of that baby from the other tribe was now in the care of this tribe and woe be that tribe if anything happened to that baby. And when they did this, all the men of, and women of one tribe would come and lay hands on that baby and identify with that act. That was their peace child. Their guarantee. Well, this then opened the door for the missionary to touch base from the gospel with a point in their culture and say, God did exactly this in Christ Jesus. He took his only son and gave him as a peace child so that the enmity, the anger between God and man could be brought to an end and Jesus' presence in life is our guarantee of God's safety towards us. And that society, even though they admired betrayal, did not admire anyone who betrayed a peace child. Anyone who would kill a peace child from that tribe was less than worthless. Judas, all of a sudden, no longer became the outstanding member of the apostolic band. He was the worst because he had betrayed the peace child. To me, a fascinating demonstration in a modern cultural setting of, of this aspect here which Paul presents. We sometimes as Christians are perplexed with the question, what about those who have never heard the gospel? Paul is saying on the one hand, there is a law of conscience, and if they will obey it, they will find themselves moving toward God. It is as if to say, two men are lost in a forest in the dark of night. One is a good man who has become lost and who is seeking to be found. The other is a thief who is seeking to get even more lost. A search party comes into the forest with great lights. The man who is seeking to be found comes to the light. The man who is running from justice and who has done wrong is seeking to go further into the forest to escape the light. So when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes, as Jesus himself said in John 3, those who want good, who seek by their well-doing glory and honor and immortality, they will come to the light. Those who do not want the light will flee from it. If by the law of impartiality we are judged, and if we have had the written law and have not kept it, if those who do the works of the law will be justified by doing the law, as Paul says, then we have no hope because we have not kept all the works of the law and therefore cannot be justified. Oh, we could leave on that gloomy note must remember that Romans is a, is a, in the first time it was heard, the totality of it was heard. And here we're going to quit at verse 16. And I thought as I, as I ended here, wow, I've not left anybody with any hope today. I said you're going to be judged by truth, you're going to be judged by works, and you're going to be judged without partiality, and no person has a prayer when those kinds of judgments are exercised against them. Who can stand the judgment of truth? 
Who can stand the judgment of works? Who can stand to be judged without God showing some preference toward him or her? And that's really what the apostle is trying to get, to have it settled in our mind that without the Savior, we are indeed lost, no matter how good we are. And in verse 16, for the first time in this moving sermon, which began with chapter 1, verse 18, for the first time, Paul introduces the name of Jesus. On that day when, according to my gospel, the secrets of men are judged by Christ Jesus. And what he does, he'll come to this in chapters 4 and 5 and 6, but what he does here is throw in, if you will, the one light of hope coming through the whole thing. That if by works we can't stand, if according to truth we can't stand, if God isn't going to be partial towards us, then how in the world can we ever stand in the midst of God's judgment? The key is wrapped up in the nature of the judge, Jesus. Who has, by the way, been the only person in all of human history who has ever met all of these three tests? He met the test of truth, didn't he? Do any of you find in me anything to accuse me of, he could say. He could say to Pilate, I am the truth. He kept the test of works. I have come to fulfill the law. And certainly in respect to partiality, God showed him no partiality. He took life, not with a silver spoon in his mouth, but he lived life at a level of suffering and intensity that no one else has ever lived it. He felt it deeper. Grew up in a poor family. Worked at a trade. Rejected by his townspeople. Mocked by the religious authorities. Betrayed by one of his trusted. Condemned to death. Spit upon. Scourged. Slapped. Nailed to a cross. Put in a borrowed tomb. Did God show partiality toward him? Not in the least. But because he met the tests of truth and works and righteousness, God raised his own beloved son from the dead, our peace child. And that one is our only hope now for salvation. There is no other hope. If by the time you have come to Romans chapter 2, verse 16, you are looking for some other way to be righteous with God other than Christ Jesus, then you will never be saved. There is no way you could ever have peace with God if you are still trusting in yourself or your goodness. This passage is meant to open a doorway of hope into our life that we may look unto Jesus who alone holds the key to being saved. Let's look to the Lord now in prayer. We quiet ourselves in this moment, our Father. We humble our hearts before you. We leap ahead in our vision to that day when life will be finished and completed on this earth. And we will stand before you personally. We think of that awesome moment when we will see you face to face for the very first time. We think of your words coming to us which you spoke when you walked the shores of our earth. How you said you would come again to judge the world. And you would put those acceptable to you on one side and those unacceptable to you on the other side. We think as we sit here today in the midst of your church how this fellowship of people is something more than a 
company gathered together to learn how to be better citizens, more proficient in our talents, more adept in our abilities, but how we are really a life-death people, how we are either or, how we are either headed toward you or away from you, how we either have life or are visited by death. There is no in-between. There is a chasm, a gulf, from you to us. We look at the scriptures, we look within, and we see a witness from the inside of us bearing witness to the written word outside of us. That we arise ourselves to condemn ourselves. That we too have failed and fallen short of the glory of God. That we have not been what we wanted to be. We have not been what we ought to be. And if left on the basis of our own life to stand before you, who could stand in the day of your appearing? Seeing that again, Lord, and seeing it in a fresh way, creates within us who know you a welling up within our hearts once more of that great gratitude and joy, which like an artesian well is bubbling to the surface now, but in that day to come when we shall see you face to face, that well shall zoom out in all its fountain of praise and rejoicing and glory about your throne. So we confess that our hope is built on nothing less than your own blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest seducing line of man, but wholly lean upon your blessed name. We confess that with all of our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.